Well, this morning, uh, brothers and sisters, we are continu continuing our Advent series looking at the question of what are you waiting for? And if you'll remember in the first Sunday, we were, uh, we were looking at how we were waiting, what kind of waiting we were doing. And we are not doing the passive sit-around waiting. We are not doing the waiting where you just sort of sit on the porch and gaze out into the distance waiting for something to happen or someone to come. We are not doing the kind of waiting that is portrayed in the play Waiting for Godot. We are not doing the kind of waiting where you just sit around talking absurdly about things that don't really matter. Nor are we doing uh, the other kind of waiting in Waiting for Godot, futile waiting, waiting for something that will never happen. Instead, we are waiting for something that will surely and truly happen, which is the return of our Lord Jesus, Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and our King. But not only are we waiting for that strong, sure promise to happen, we are also waiting in a way that is active. We are actively waiting. We do not wait passively. Just like we said of the folks in the fictional show Downton Abbey, the servants who are there when, when their masters, when their lord and lady go off to do whatever it is that they are doing, the servants who are left behind have many, many, many things that they must do. All kinds of tasks that they have set before them that they can do while they wait. So that when their Lord and Master returns, they are prepared and they have done the good work that has been assigned to them. That is what we talked about on the first Sunday of Advent. Now the second Sunday of Advent, we, we were to continue that series, but unfortunately I was sick. And so uh, David Morgan... Uh, just we're so grateful for that. He uh, read a sermon for us, and, and that was greatly appreciated. Thank you, by the way, for your prayers and thoughts. I'm feeling much better now. This week, we are talking about waiting for strength, which may seem interesting because we lit the candle of joy. And the passage we are about to read starts off with comfort. And so what is it? What are we talking about? Are we talking about joy, comfort, strength? What are we waiting for? Well, the answer is yes. Yes, we are waiting for joy and comfort and strength. All of those things. So turn with me, if you will, to uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. In it we read these words. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, Go up on a high mountain, you who bring good news to Jerusalem. Lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, Here is your God. 
see the Sovereign Lord comes with power and He rules with a mighty arm. See, His reward is with Him and His recompense accompanies Him. He tends His flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in His arms and carries them close to His heart. He gently leads those that have young. The Word of the Lord. Amen. As is always the case, we need to remember we need to remember the context of what we're reading. And particularly with prophecy like you find in the book of Isaiah and, and many other places in the Bible, we need to remember that there are often uh, there are often more than one context at play in these passages. In Isaiah the, the, the book of Isaiah has focused largely up until this point on the judgment that the people of Judah have uh, deservedly received from God. The exile that they are facing, the realities of the punishment that they are facing for their unfaithfulness to God's covenant and to God's law. But Isaiah chapter 40 begins a new page in this book. And it is instead of looking to all that Israel has done that is wrong, it is looking forward to the future when God will restore the people of Israel, the people of Judah, back to their promised land. And so, in one way, the context of what we are looking at is the specific historical accounts of what Judah did in breaking covenant with God over and over and over again. And what God has done and will do in response, leading up to the restoration of the people back to Judah, but also we are looking beyond that. We are looking beyond that into messianic promises. The promise of Jesus, really. The promise that He will ultimately come. This is, this is why we can see uh, we can see in the very beginning, comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Essentially, what, what Isaiah is saying through the inspiration of the Spirit is he is looking forward to the time when their exile will be over, that they've done their time, as it were. And, and this is interesting because when, when you think about going to jail for your crimes, which I know is probably going to happen soon for you, right, Abby? <laughs> anytime. Anytime they're going to catch up with me. Ah, right? No, when you think about getting caught for your crimes and going to jail, you probably don't think that the end of your time, you will not only be released into the world, but you'll also get all kinds of good stuff too. Right? That's not how it goes, right? You get released from jail after you've done your time, <coughs> but then <clears throat> you're sort of on your own. There's some, there's some services and things to help. Um, you know, there's, there's transitional ministries that help you move from prison life to the real world or whatever. But it's not like the person whom you wronged, right? Somebody murdered my uh, child, and then they come out of jail, and I say to them, hey, you've done your time, that's great. Now I'm going to adopt you as my child and bring you into my home and make you inherit all my stuff. That's not really the way that works, right? But yet, this is, what, this is what Isaiah is alluding to when he says that they have received from the Lord's hand double for all their sins. They have paid, they have done their time 
and God will give to them more bounty than they have, far more bounty than they have any right to expect. Then, of course, we move on into verse 3 and following, a voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. And, and this, we know, of course, refers largely to John the Baptist and his ministry preparing the way for Jesus. And then we read about how people, in verses 7 through 8, people may be faithless. People last for a day. People wither like grass and flowers. But the promise is the Word of God lasts forever. And this is where the comfort comes in. Right? Here is your God. Verse 9. Here is your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power. And He rules with a mighty arm. See His reward is with Him and His recompense accompanies Him. He tends His flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in His arms and carries them close to His heart. He gently leads those that have young. This is the comfort that we see in the beginning of chapter 40. And this is the joy that we have. We can rejoice because God comes, the Savior comes, and, and His Word is faithful, His Word is strong, His Word is true. Even though we are like grass or like flowers, God comes and He gathers us and He tenderly leads us and sustains us. Now I can see how that is comforting. And I can also see how that brings joy. But how does it bring strength? How does it bring strength? Well, in order to think about that, we need to look briefly at what the Heidelberg Catechism says about comfort. There are, <clears throat> there are six times in the Heidelberg Catechism where the word comfort is used. Six times. If we look at those, we get an idea of what the, the, the writers of the Catechism thought that comfort meant. Question and answer one. That's obviously the first occurrence of the word comfort. What is your only comfort in life and in death? What is your only comfort <coughs> in life and in death? Answer, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. He has fully paid for all my sins with His precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. That is comforting, for sure. But that's not where that answer ends. Because I belong to Him, Christ by His Holy Spirit assures me of eternal life, even more comforting, and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for Him. See, this is where comfort and strength come together. Imagine you wake up on the wrong side of bed. This happens to me sometimes. Not literally. I mean, you know, Gwyneth and I have defined sides. So, you know, waking up on her side, well, that would probably be disastrous for me. <coughs> right? But you wake up on the wrong side of bed and you are just, you are not looking forward to Today. You know you have bad things in store for you, or at least you feel like you know that. You are sad, you are depressed, you can barely get yourself out of bed. 
you need comfort. Not, not the comfort of your bed, because that might tempt you to stay there, but the comfort of knowing that it's going to be okay. You'll be all right. You are not alone. You can get through this because there are those who are pulling for you, who are there to support you. When you have that comfort that there are people there to support you, then you can maybe swig your, swing your legs out of the bed and put your feet on the floor. And you can maybe, you know, get those pants on one leg at a time. And you can take those steps to get to the kitchen and get your breakfast. You see, comfort brings strength. Comfort brings strength. This is what we are waiting for today. And again, it's not a waiting as in, <clears throat> you know, we sit passively by and do nothing, waiting for God to download some motivation into our lives. It is the, the waiting that we do that recognizes that the comfort we have in belonging to Jesus Christ is not some far off reality although we do not know when Jesus will return precisely, but it is so true, it is such a sure promise, that it made as, might as well be today. It might as well have already happened. Right? It's, it's, like, it's like talking to the person who is utterly and totally reliable. Like Jared. No. But let's just pretend. Pretend that Jared is utterly reliable. If I say to Jared, if I say to Jared, hey Jared, can you pick me up a part from Feenstra's because I really need it for my tractor, because I have a tractor. <laughs> right? And Jared says, oh yeah, sure, totally. I'm swinging by that way or whatever. Right? I can, I can live in the comfort of knowing that it is, it is going to happen. Because Jared, Jared is totally and utterly reliable. I'm not laughing. <laughs> Sorry. I trust you. <laughs> anyway, right? So I, I can go about my day not worrying about that because it's taken care of. It's done. It's going to be... Like, I might as well live as if it is, it's already done. Right? This is the truth of God's promises. Is that when God says, this is what I will do, it is done. Right? So we see that the comfort offered to the people of Israel, the comfort offered to us, brings joy. I can rejoice because the part that I ordered through Jared, it's, yeah, it's as good as here. Right? And I can have the strength to carry on. The people of Israel knew this, or at least they were learning this. It was hard for them, understandably, but they learned this because when, when Isaiah says that, that their time is done and they will be returned and they will be given double for all their sins, it was true. God did return them to Jerusalem. God did return them to Judah. But not only that, because you could look at the, the history of the people of Israel, you could look at the history of the people of Judah and say, well, you know, when they came back, they had their struggles, and, and it, was never, it was never all that great in some political you know, way. You know, they never got back sort of the power that they had under David or Solomon or something like that. You could look at it that way. Except, except that the promise here is not primarily for political power or anything like that. 
It is for the Messiah. And so, yeah, the people of Judah came back. Yeah, they had their struggles. But more importantly, more importantly, the voice in the wilderness cried out and prepared the way. And the Son of God, Jesus Christ, God with us, Emmanuel, and so we have comfort brothers and sisters this is the comfort that we have listen to what the other the other uses of comfort are in the catechism for a moment question and answer two goes on what must you know to live and die in the joy of this comfort three things first how great my sin and misery are. Second, <coughs> how I am set free from all my sins and misery. And third, how I am to thank God for such deliverance. You need to know how bad it is, how much you've been freed from, and how that happened, and how you can live in grateful response to that gift. How does Christ's return, this is question and answer 52, how does Christ's return to judge the living and the dead comfort you? In all distress and persecution, with uplifted head, I confidently await the very judge who has already offered himself to the judgment of God in my place and removed the whole curse from me. Christ will cast all his enemies and mine into everlasting condemnation, but will take me and all his chosen ones to himself into the glory and joy of heaven. What do you believe concerning the Holy Spirit? Question and answer 53. First, that the Spirit with the Father and the Son is eternal God. Second, that the Spirit is given also to me so that through true faith, He makes me share in Christ and all His benefits, comforts me, and will remain with me forever. Question and answer 57. How does the resurrection of the body comfort you? Not only will my soul be taken immediately after this life to Christ its head, but also my very flesh will be raised by the power of Christ reunited with my soul and made like Christ's glorious body. Question and answer 58. How does the article concerning life everlasting comfort you? Even as I already now experience in my heart the beginning of eternal joy, so after this life I will have such perfect blessedness such as no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human heart has ever imagined a blessedness in which to praise God forever. Brothers and sisters, this Sunday we are reminded that we are waiting for strength. Not passively waiting as in, well, someday I'll be strong, but actively waiting, knowing the comfort of God's promises are true, living in joy. Sometimes, maybe feeling like we can barely take one step, but nonetheless, strengthened because of the comfort and joy of the truth of God's promises and of His Son. Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we pray that you would indeed revive in us the comfort and joy and strength that we find in your truth, your promises, your Son, your Spirit, you yourself, O oh great three in one. May we this day 
and forevermore. May the comfort of belonging to You make us wholeheartedly willing and ready to serve You. To do those good things that You have called us to do. Oh God, You know that sometimes it may be hard for us to get out of bed in the morning. Hard for us to take the bold step. Hard for us to share the good news of who You are with others. Hard for us to live a life full of hope. And yet, O oh God, Your promises are true. And so, Lord, may You, through Your Spirit, through Your Word, and through the encouragement of brothers and sisters, may You strengthen us so that we may live in that truth. Guide us, O oh God, as we actively wait for strength, living in the truth of Your promise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, when we are given comfort and strength through the promises of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we have that joy, it is something that we share just like I shared enthusiastically with you how reliable Jared is, so we share far more than that. We share the joy of how reliable and true our God and His promises are. So let us stand and sing together, Go Tell It on the Mountain.